There aren't many bigger comeback stories than the one of the Yakuza series in the Western market. Yakuza went from being a series of niche Japanese games that were lucky to get a digital-only pity English release years after the Japanese one to headlining major trade show presentations. I mean, it's big enough that it's got its own presentations nowadays. And sitting right in the middle of this grand revival of the series is one game, the subject of today's video, Yakuza 0. Yakuza 0 does a lot of things right. I mean, it does a ton of things really right. The thumbnail of this video? That isn't a joke. Yakuza 0 had to be a game that served as a prequel to a series which, by 2017, had over a decade of history, 10 games counting spin-offs. To say it had expectations to live up to is, uh, kind of an understatement, but I'd say not only did it live up to those expectations, it well exceeded them. Why, you might ask? Well, stick around and find out. I want to talk about Yakuza 0 today, and I'm gonna let you know beforehand, I've got a lot of important cultural tidbits to work in here and there as well, so I can at least guarantee that this video is gonna be a take on the series you might not have heard before. Why is Ryo Hazuki in the corner there? You'll find out, trust me. As usual, I'll drop a spoiler warning before the spicy stuff begins, so with that relatively quick intro out of the way, let's get into this. Now personally, I've always been a big fan of Sega's Yakuza franchise. I picked up 4 on a whim in late 2011 and was absolutely blown away by this game in a series I'd never heard anyone talk about before. And talk about great timing to get into the series, because after 4 is when it would, uh, pretty much fall off a cliff. In the West, at least. The Yakuza series had always been a hard sell in the West. Hell, it was a hard sell in Japan. When former Monkey Ball F-Zero GX series producer Toshihiro Nagoshi pitched the concept to the higher-ups at Sega, they pretty much told him to take a hike, and the negotiation didn't get much easier from there. He had to fight Sega to let him make the game, then he had to fight Sony to let him put it on their console, and then he had to fight Zero, the Japanese ratings board, to allow the games to even come out. Hard to imagine considering the series is in, like, service games' top three biggest breadwinners today, but you know how it be sometimes. Um, service games is what Sega stands for, by the way. Eventually, Yakuza 1 finally did come out on the PS2, and what do you know, it was a big success. And then it got a sequel, which was a bigger success. But while the series had a pretty consistent popularity trend in Japan, around 2012, it took a big nosedive in Western markets. So much so, that the localization of Yakuza 5 sat in limbo for 1,097 days, before getting a barely announced PSN Store exclusive release. So, what happened between Yakuza 4 and 5 that nearly put this series in the dirt? A lot of people blame Yakuza Dead Souls, the, uh, weird zombie spin-off game, and that's fair. Because generously put, that game is pretty not great. Yeah, it turns out when you put an emphasis on gun combat in a series with notoriously not good gun combat, it ain't gonna break a milli sales in week one. You could also put some blame on the general trend away from Japanese games in the 7th gen console era. Or how people were becoming more and more reluctant to play a game if it had a big number on it. See the amount of reboots using the name of the game or name of the game plus release here as a title, or sequels that would drop their number entirely for a subtitle instead. I mean, look at The Witcher 3 box, it's basically trying to hide its number. Starting a series at the number 5 was a pretty big hurdle for a lot of people, especially a series as story-focused as Yakuza was. Or is, I should say. There's likely no one big thing to definitively point to and say, that's it, that's what did it in. It was a combination of multiple factors adding up, but either way, the mid-2010s was looking pretty grim for old Kiryu. The Ryuga Gotoku Studio, the developers behind the series, wouldn't abandon the Western market entirely, though. They put out more, hashtag, Western-focused experimental games, like Binary Domain, see my video on it for more details. But even that would end up being a pretty big commercial wet fart. Pretty much when all hope was lost that this series would ever make it outside of Japan again, in 2017, Yakuza 0 came out, almost two full years after its Japanese release. And let me tell you, it hit. It hit big. Like, really big. So big that while the series had to play catch up for a while with the games that had already come out in Japan, by lost judgment, it was seen a day and date worldwide release. So, why? For a series that was looking like it was going to get the plug pulled on it for the insurance payout, why did the early 2017 release of Yakuza 0 basically reverse that overnight? Yakuza 0 even had stock issues when it first came out in English. I'm telling you, no one anticipated it selling this well. I mean, I could say the game was good so it sold well, but you and I both know that explanation is too simple and unsatisfying to be the whole story. 
One reason, I believe, is that it came out during a period I like to call the Japanese game Renaissance. Again, I've told this story so many times I feel like an old man at this point, but early 2017 was massive for Japanese games. It was pretty much the hard-cut line that ended the whole whoa, haha, all Japanese games are wacky and dumb trite mentality that plagued the 7th gen of consoles in popular media. <laughs> wow, in JRPG Hour 1, you pick berries, and in Hour 50, you kill God! <laughs> what a knee slapper, fellas! Again, a sentiment that wasn't helped by a lot of incompetent mismanagement in big Japanese companies at the time, but I'm glad we're past that. Another reason is Yakuza 0 got a lot of word-of-mouth marketing. I mean, it still does. I'm doing it right now. A lot of stuff in this game is easily shareable out of context, and it's pretty cool, which is why timing played a big factor. What would have probably been dismissed as too wacky and too Japanese in, say, 2013 was rightfully shared for being pretty damn cool in 2017. Kiryu singing about his regrets in a karaoke bar while sipping Yamazaki single malt whiskey to forget? Don't tell me you've never heard of Bakami Tai. The over-the-top action scenes where two muscular men rip off their $3,000 suits and brawl on a rooftop? Now that's hype. Don't even try to tell me you've never seen a Yakuza out of context video. I won't believe you. Videos, articles, memes, and reviews were made, introducing a lot of people to the series, and it helps that Yakuza 0 was the perfect answer to the question, which Yakuza game should I start with? 1 and 2 were at the time PS2 exclusives, and uh, also on the Wii U in Japan, but the statistical likelihood that a single person who owned 1 and 2 for the Wii U is watching this video right now is probably the same as me getting struck by lightning. Twice. Tomorrow. Yakuza 3 has a side story kind of feeling, 4 is good, but it requires a lot of prior knowledge, and you basically had to draw a summoning circle in the grass and sacrifice an effigy to play 5, and so on. While Yakuza 0 does have a lot of references you miss out on if this was your first outing in the series, it was arguably the perfect place to start. It put a decent focus on easing you into the world and introducing you to these characters gradually. Well, except for the part where a character named Tachibana basically barfs out Kiryu's entire autobiography to catch newcomers up, but, you know, necessary sacrifices. It gave you an insight into these characters' backstories and history while not spoiling anything from later entries. It integrated itself perfectly into the timeline, and that play order argument only got stronger when Yakuza Kiwami came out, which wasn't only a remake of Yakuza 1, but also filled the role of a sequel to Zero. Then Kiwami 2 came out, and in current year 2023, you can basically play the entire series start to finish on a PS4 or PC. So yeah, Yakuza came back big, and it's here to stay. My ultimate core memory was finishing Yakuza 4 in 2011 and checking the wiki, which at the time barely had a sentence or two per character. Now, you can spend an entire afternoon reading through just the... I don't know, the Majima Everywhere system or something. Still waiting for Yakuza Black Panther to get a Western release, though. No? Eh, whatever. I'll just go play Uppers instead. You have no idea how long I've been waiting to make a reference to that game. So you might be asking, what is Yakuza 0 about? Yakuza 0 tells the beginning of the longtime series protagonist Kazuma Kiryu's story. In the modern day, he's known as the legendary Dragon of Dojima, but here, he's just some 20-something rank-and-file low-level gangster trying to live it up in 1980s Japan. Good food, going out drinking with his boys, getting into fights, life isn't very complicated for him at this point. He just spends his nights hanging out with his best friend and fellow member of the Dojima family, Akira Nishikiyama. Yakuza 0 is a chance for us to get a look at a younger, less hardened, and more emotive version of Kiryu. Kiryu's simple life changes, though, when he takes on a job from a loan shark and beats a guy down for the Kashios. While we see Kiryu only roughing him up, he turns up dead in the exact spot Kiryu left him. This is, yeah, no doubt bad news, but the news gets even worse when Kiryu is called into his boss's office and we're introduced to this game's lineup of hardcore antagonists. Ken no clan leader Kuze, Taihei Association leader Awano, and Shibusawa family leader, uh, Shibusawa. These three are the kind of antagonists you just love to hate. They're brash, rude, and ruthless. Especially Kuze, he's just such a greasy dirtbag. Hmm, it's great. The whole clan structure is kinda complicated and the game throws out a bunch of names pretty quickly, so let me break it down real quick. Basically, at the top is the Tojo clan, which all the families belong to. Dojima is one of the lieutenants of the Tojo clan and has his own family. That further branches off with Dojima's underlings, Kuze, Awano, and Shibusawa, who each have a gang of their own. Kiryu, on the other hand, is part of the Kazuma family, headed by his foster father, Shintaro Kazuma, but he's in jail during the game's events. Kazuma basically holds a rank 1 level up from Kuze, Awano, and Shibusawa, but still works under Dojima. 
Side note, I personally wouldn't have made the name Kazuma sound so similar to Kiryu's name, Kazuma, especially considering how often they're brought up in the same sentence, but that's just the way it is. Anyways, the Dojima Slime Gang demands Kiryu take responsibility for the killing and turn himself into the police. At this point, we the audience are supposed to think, hmm, maybe Kiryu accidentally did kill him. But then, some crucial info is brought up. He was killed with a gun, which means it definitely wasn't Kiryu. Shibusawa is initially receptive of Kiryu saying he was framed, but regardless, someone has to take the fall. And the most likely candidate is the man in the room who's currently at the bottom of this food chain. But then, things get even more complicated when it's revealed that the place the man was murdered, the empty lot, was a key point in the Tojo clan's Kamadocho revitalization project, a real estate operation to buy up a bunch of land and turn a profit for it. The whole plot of Yakuza 0 is centered around this empty lot, so it's an important plot point from this point forward. As Kiryu's running out of time to turn himself into the police, he follows the thread until he finds out he was framed by none other than the lieutenants of the Dojima clan. They're all vying to take the empty lot for themselves, which will earn them Kazuma's seat as Dojima's top lieutenant. Kuze frames Kiryu and tries to use it as leverage to get him to spy on Kazuma, but Kiryu refuses. In order to clear his name, he fights through the Dojima clan's headquarters to get an audience with the frog patriarch himself and get expelled from the clan. He's successful, and later teams up with a real estate agent, Tetsu Tachibana, and his right-hand man, Oda. Tachibana is revealed to be working behind the scenes with none other than Kazuma himself, and the pair work together to uncover the mystery of the empty lot and its owner while keeping Kiryu out of the police's hands. All while the Dojima family is hot on their tail. Kiryu gets a new white suit, and learns how to operate outside the criminal underworld, and our story kicks off for real. It's a massive free-for-all in downtown Tokyo, and everyone's got their eyes on a single goal, the empty lot. Now hang on, you might be thinking, there's a second dude on that box. What's with him? And yeah, we're not done here. Kiryu's story is only half of the full picture, this game is twin protagonists. Yakuza 0 also gives us an insight into Goro Majima, the mad dog of Shimano's backstory. This is also the first time in the series that Goro Majima is a playable character. Unless you count Dead Souls. I'm not gonna tell you if you should or not, you do you. The scene starts off in a club called The Grand, when a customer gets a bit too bevied and starts throwing wrists. The manager gets called, and we find out that manager is none other than Goro Majima himself. He gets a bottle of alcohol poured over his head, and then does, like, the most un-Majima thing in response. He outwits the customer, and turns the altercation into a way to make profit, keeping the customer's record clean and raking in cash for his club. Majima here is well-spoken, eloquent, calm and calculating, a complete 180 from his character up to this point. Yakuza 0 tells a story about how this man in front of us became the mad dog of Shimano we know in the later series. So basically, Majima's oath brother Saijima lit up a bunch of dudes from a rival gang. Majima tried to stop him, but that was directly disobeying his superior's orders. That sounds like a strike one kind of offense, but it just sucks that his superior is the power-hungry leader of the Shimano family, big man Futoshi Shimano. He keeps Majima locked up for a year, expels him from the gang, and then traps him in Sotenbori, forcing him to earn money by running the Grand. Majima can't leave Osaka, and he can't rejoin the family until he's made a significant enough, but always ambiguous investment. Majima is kept under lock and key by Shimano's oath brother, Sagawa of the Omi Alliance. Yeah, I told you this stuff gets complex and names just come flying out. Basically, Shimano is a Tojo clan lieutenant, same as Dojima, and the Omi Alliance is a separate large enemy clan that works mainly in Osaka. Sagawa offers Majima a deal, keep slaving away at the club, or do a hit on someone for a fast track back into the Yakuza. Side note, important point, Majima and Kiryu have never canonically killed anyone, despite what appears to be, uh, evidence to the contrary, your honor. What happens in battles stays in battles, I guess. So yeah, Majima has never killed anyone before, and he's repeatedly warned that once you cross that line, there's no going back, but he's desperate at this point, so he takes the deal. He's told his target is some lowlife that traffics women and forces them to work for him named Makoto Makimura. Makoto is a gender-neutral Japanese name, by the way. This point is important. After Majima finally tracks down who he believes is Makoto Makimura and has a boss fight with massive man, it's revealed that Makoto Makimura is a blind woman in her 20s that works at a chiropractor clinic. Yeah, doesn't quite fit the description, huh? Two years ago she was kidnapped, and the trauma of that event caused her to lose her eyesight. The only thing she can remember is that her kidnapper was a man with a bat tattoo. The owner of the chiropractor clinic where she worked rescued her, gave her a job, and pretended to be Makoto Makimura in her place to find the bat tattoo man. 
In the end, Majima can't bring himself to do the job, and instead ends up helping Makoto, since the Yomi Alliance is aiming for her as well, and it's not quite clear why yet. So, the entire game plays on an interweaving structure. Kiryu and Majima's stories overlap, but the two never directly run into each other. Kiryu's events give an insight into Majima's, and vice versa. The game is divided into 17 chapters, and you play two chapters as each character before switching to the next one. So, for example, 1 and 2 are Kiryu, 3 and 4 are Majima, 5 and 6 are Kiryu again, and so on. This two-chapter on-off setup is perfect for the pacing and storytelling. The story can keep you on edge, build tension, and then cash in on it when you switch between the characters. For example, at the end of Chapter 4, Majima, who's still conflicted on what he's going to do with Makoto, pulls out his knife as the camera fades out. We don't know what's going to happen here. We know how desperate he is to get back into the Yakuza, and we haven't spent enough time to gather a rapport with this new, calm, collected Majima to be able to say what he would do in this situation. You play through the next few Kiryu chapters with it constantly in the back of your mind. Then, right as the Kiryu section is about to end in Chapter 6, you get one of the most emotional, heartstring-pulling moments in the entire series. Nishiki draws a gun on Kiryu who's being hunted by the Dojima clan. Nishiki doesn't do this because he's trying to stab his friend in the back for glory, he's doing it because he knows what'll happen to Kiryu if he gets captured by Dojima. He puts his gun down knowing he can't shoot the closest thing in the world he has to a brother, and the both of them realize they've found themselves in a world that neither of them were truly prepared for. And then, Kiryu drives off. You get the payoff for the Majima bit by finding out what happened to him when Chapter 7 starts, but now you have a new mystery. What happened to Kiryu after the car scene with Nishiki? This game is a master at pulling off setups and payoffs, and it helps that the story beats are absolutely bombastic and over the top. Yakuza 0 knows exactly how to pull off going at full 100, and the more quiet, dramatic character-focused scenes interspersed with this action really lend to why I think this game's storytelling hit the mark with so many people. It kicks off with immediate intrigue, and nothing ever feels like it's outstayed its welcome. The pacing gives everything a chance to breathe, while also keeping you on the edge of your seat. Another reason I think this game hit the mark with so many people is because it's really obvious that it was made with a love for Japan, both culturally and physically. The Yakuza series has always been basically the closest thing you can get to video game tourism. I knew this immediately when 20 minutes in, after a night of drinking, Kiryu and Nishiki go out for Shime Ramen, which is basically the Japanese equivalent of a cheeky 2am trip to McDonald's. The setting of Yakuza, Kamurocho, is based off Kabukicho, a real-life location in Shinjuku, Tokyo, and Sotenbori is based off Dotonbori, an area in real-life Osaka. Each of these areas were so well-researched and brought to life in the world of the game. The streets of Kamurocho are basically a one-to-one -one recreation of the real-life Kabukicho, a place most people would consider to be the roughest area in Japan. Complete with packed wall-to-wall -wall streets covered in bars, people trying to wave you into their sometimes less-than-wholesome establishments, and so on. This version of Kamurocho depicts Kabukicho as it looked in the 1980s. A lot of things are the same, but some stuff is obviously a bit different. Terakura in particular haven't made it into the 21st century, and after reading a thorough summary of what they are on Wikipedia, I gotta say, Showa businessmen had a strange idea of entertainment. This is gonna sound like a joke, but you could probably serve as a pretty decent tour guide of the real-life Kabukicho if you've played a few Yakuza games. Hey, look at that. And, uh, it's not in zero, but on the right would be Stardust. You know, you walk down the street, everything's familiar. Where the, uh, Gindako would be, it's, uh, Chicken Fighter. Oh, and look, the Millennium Tower. Theater Square looks a lot like, it's a lot more dead in real life. But you know, it's nothing you've seen before. That's where the Sega Arcade is. Game Panic. You know, there's the parking lot where Kiryu goes to beat people up. And this doesn't have anything to do with anything, but uh, Monkey. Oh hey, it really is just like the game. 
And you know, this is the exact spot, the Don Quixote, where like the people were lining up for not Dragon Quest, Dragon Quest 3. I mean, the Don Quixote is in the same place in real life and in the game. And the same kind of love is given to Sotenbori. The iconic Glico man might not be there for, uh, you know, copyright reasons, but the multiple bridges spanning over the canal is an iconic Osaka landmark. There's some stuff that's different, but that's just because Yakuza 0 is depicting how it looked some 30 odd years ago. And these references to real life Japan just get deeper and deeper as the game goes on. Like, okay, I was howling during this scene because I saw it and I knew exactly what they were referencing. Of all things on this green earth, the curse of Colonel Sanders. The KFC guy. Where, after a 1985 Japan Baseball Championship Series win by the Osaka region-based team, the Hanshin Tigers, passionate fans were hurling themselves into the canal to celebrate. One fan was jumping in per member of the team as a ritual of sorts, but they realized they were lacking a Caucasian effigy to toss in to represent... current United States Senator Randy Bass? And oh my god, what, what am I saying? How are the words coming out of my mouth real right now? Like, that's how deep the references this game pulls are. Anyways, the baseball fans, in their battle lust, saw a statue of Colonel Sanders sitting outside a nearby KFC, figured that was a good enough white guy, and punted the thing into the bottom of the river. The Hanshin Tigers would never win a championship series again, and it's said that's because the burning hatred of Colonel Sanders' lust for revenge has cursed the team in perpetuity. Um, anyways, where were we again? Oh, yeah, so not only is the world packed with adoration for its real-life counterpart, it's also an extremely interesting world to explore as well. I've often heard the cursed phrase, Yakuza is like Japanese GTA, and no, no, it's, it's nothing like that. That's a comparison made so people can sneak out of having to explain it properly. If I hear anyone say Yakuza is Japanese GTA one more time, I'm gonna yell. Or cry, probably the second, but don't make me have to choose. Compared to most traditional open world games, Yakuza's world is downright tiny. It encompasses a few city blocks, and you can probably walk from one end to the other in like two minutes. But I think in the year of 2023, we know size isn't an accurate measure of quality for an open world, and what Yakuza lacks in size, it makes up for in denseness. A common complaint with the open world genre is that while the worlds may be massive and sprawling, they often feel slapped together, lacking in meaningful design. If that's the case, the Yakuza series is the exact opposite. Every inch of this world is so dense and thoughtfully designed, no space is wasted. Vertical area design instead of horizontal area design. Build tall instead of build wide. You know, kind of like real life Japan. You can basically just exist in this ultra detailed open environment. You can choose which restaurant you want to go to and eat a meal. You can head to an arcade and play Space Harrier, the 1985 Sega arcade game. Or what the heck, spend a few rounds on the crane game. Just as unfair as in real life. They've done it again, fellas. You can go shopping, sing karaoke, drink in a bar, play pool. Every corner of this world is something new to do. And then to add to the immersion, in-game mechanics are contextualized with stuff from the real world. You save at payphones. If you need to fast travel, you take a taxi. And you can heal yourself by eating at a restaurant and paying a pretty accurate price for the food. Or just walk into a convenience store and stare at the magazines or something. I won't tell you what to do. The world is so well designed, you'll often find yourself just mesmerized by the glitz and glam of 1980s Tokyo as you walk around it. In this one scene from the opening where Kiryu is hanging out with Nishiki, every time the camera angle changes in the cutscene, you're basically looking at a new desktop background. The world is one of the reasons I keep coming back to this series, and Yakuza 0 is an opportunity to see Kamurocho like you haven't really before, since it's set in the 80s. But when you start digging at the roots of the Yakuza series, you might find that its ideas are pretty similar to another game. A game released in 1999 for the Sega Dreamcast, Shenmue. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that the Yakuza series is the spiritual successor to Shenmue. They both take place in an extremely faithful rendition of real-life Japan, with Shenmue taking place in Dobuita, a small area of the real-life city of Yokosuka. And they share a lot more DNA than just that. They're both games that let you interact with people around the world. They both have stores and restaurants to explore, a third-person action combat system, you learn moves from strange fellows you meet around the world, and they both have some, uh, weird, outdated stereotypes. No, Sorry, nothing, but. 
Chinese no kyaku kurune. And you can play Space Harrier in both, so, you know, basically the same game. Is Elder Chen in Yakuza 0 a reference to Master Chen in Shenmue? I may be seeing ghosts here, but you can't tell me it's not. Who was Shenmue's producer, by the way? Well, what do you know, it's longtime Yakuza director Toshihiro Nagoshi himself. Nagoshi worked on Shenmue as a producer and an uncredited director six years before Yakuza would release, so it makes sense that there would be some overlap. But here's the thing, you see. I stand before you all today to admit that I'm a fraud, because I'd never actually played Shenmue. Well, that is, until I played it in preparation for this video. And, well, I like it. I think it's a game with a lot of charm. Now, does it have problems? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah it does. Look, I just want to talk to you, Suzuki, okay? I, I just want to ask him what was he thinking with the forklift bit. That's all I want to know. And I want to know who designed his website, because uh, that, that is a bad looking website. And, you know, there's also the thing where whenever you have to wait for a timed event, you have to stand outside the door like a crazy person waiting for it to open. I do get what Yu Suzuki was going for. He wanted you to just go out and kill time and legit enjoy being alive in this virtual world, but I'm so glad Shenmue 2 added the option to fast forward the clock. I can respect Shenmue for basically being the first game of its kind when it came out in 1999. Nothing like this had ever been done before, and Shenmue would become the blueprint for everything that came after. At the time, Shenmue was the most expensive video game ever made, and it was mind-blowing in its sheer scale and detail. You can see how the Yakuza games took what worked from Shenmue and left out what didn't to create a better experience. Shenmue walked so Yakuza could run. You are my best friend, yo! Yo! I'm <clears throat> <clears throat> So with that background out of the way, let's talk about how Yakuza plays. As far as combat goes, the Yakuza series is pretty much the platonic ideal of a 3D open world beat-em-up. You roam around the streets until someone looks at you funny, and if they catch up to you, you enter what is basically a JRPG random battle with fists. Why do so many people see a random guy wearing a suit on the street and want to go practice throwing wrists at him? Well, the PSP game lore is that gangs throw their rookies at Kiryu as part of an initiation ritual, and Yakuza 4 and 5 state that walking fast emits a this dude wants to fight aura. What I'm trying to say is, don't think about it too hard. When you get into one of these random battles, you're usually put up against 3 to 5 dudes in a sort of combat dimension who you have to beat down to continue. You've got a pretty standard arsenal of beat em up moves at your disposal here light attacks, heavy attacks, a grab, a dodge, the works. Yakuza's main combat system is to press a certain amount of light attacks, then slap a heavy on as a combo ender. This ender will be different depending on how many light attacks you used beforehand. Your main game plan in Yakuza 0 is getting to know your different enders, and knowing when's the best time to use each of them. You know, meaningful decision making during combat. Another main draw of Yakuza's combat is the weapons you have at your disposal. The edges of most combat arenas are littered with items you can pick up that all have their own unique moveset and combo strings. Aside from the random battles, there are also mandatory story battles, as well as what I'm gonna call... dungeons? I mean, they're large linear areas you have to fight your way through, so if they aren't dungeons, uh, I don't know, you got a better name for them? I really like these areas in particular. They're great at giving you unique, long-lasting combat scenarios. Like, how about an area where they send a flood of dudes in after you? Or how about just one really huge dude with a couch? I'd like to remind you that Kiryu has canonically never killed a man. Also, these dungeons are the game's chance to show off its most unique environments. There's this one later dungeon you go to as Majima that's fashioned after a traditional Japanese inn, and yeah, it's a lame-ass excuse to shove in an area they wanted to make, but I'm down with it. Reminds me of the Japanese garden from Metal Gear Rising. Now, I gotta be real with y'all, I'm not all that hot on Yakuza 0's combat. Now, hear me out, I'm not saying it's bad, it's at least a whole lot better than Yakuza 3's combat, if you know you know. By the way, here's your daily tidbit. My sources tell me the reason Yakuza 3's combat is so busted is because its mechanics are based off the system they made for Yakuza Kenzan. Kenzan, like Ishin, is a Japanese exclusive Yakuza game based in feudal Japan. The problem is, is that combat system was designed around the playable character using a sword, which is why enemies in Yakuza 3 feel like impenetrable fortresses that refuse to let up their block. Back to Yakuza 0's combat, it doesn't really have the depth I'd hope a series that's like 10 games in at this point would have. 
This is particularly apparent with the boss fights. The optimal strategy is usually just to get behind them and hope you can trap them in a combo before they super armor throw a roundhouse to the face. Or just find the move this particular boss won't block slash dodge and spam it. Well, actually, the real optimal strategy is just to fill your inventory up with what are known in real life as, uh, pharmaceutical energy drinks, and you'll never have to worry about getting a game over again. Alright, it's time for a taste test. It kind of tastes like, like a really bad, sweet Flintstones vitamin, if you know what that is. Like I said, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm not saying this combat system is broken or unusable or boring, but I'm just saying it's kinda weak, and considering the length of the game is nearly 30 hours, and wait, how long was Yakuza 5 again? Now that's a big game. It kinda makes sense why they were willing to turn this series into a turn-based one. Now, I'm gonna be up front, I haven't played Yakuza 7 so I can't say for sure whether or not that decision paid off for them, but judging by the reception, I'd say it was pretty well accepted. I mean, hell, the series was practically 40% RPG already. The combat system was in a really good place by Kiwami 2. It shows that the action style combat isn't broken by design. And I mean, look at the action combat in Judgment, it's practically on a different level. Dude's doing Marvel combos. With a few thoughtful tweaks, they prove that this combat system could have a lot more depth, making it more engaging. It's just a weird pocket time dimension situation, where in between Zero and Kiwami 2, two games came out, Kiwami 1 and Yakuza 6. But Kiwami 2 came out in Japan the same year Zero came out in English. We were three games behind in the series, but if you just squinted your eyes and looked in the distance, you can see how far it had already come. You just had to wait for the English releases to play catch up. But complex gameplay has never really been the Yakuza series' selling point. So while I think it's fair to criticize the combat for its lack of depth, there's one aspect of the combat that doesn't pull any punches, where the focus has really been put. The combat variety. I honestly don't even know where to begin with this. First off, both Kiryu and Majima have three different fighting styles each you can switch between during combat. Technically they have four, but the last one is a special style you have to go out of your way to get, so let's not count those for now. Each of these styles has completely different combos and moves, but more importantly, they each specialize in a certain thing. Like, Kiryu's brawler style is great for most straight-up fights, but the rush style really lets you get in for them one-on-one -on -one combat encounters. Then you got the beast style which specializes in taking out big groups of enemies with weapons. Or blocking attacks by clenching your fists and yelling really loud. I'm down with it. Majima's Thug style is kinda similar to Kiryu's Brawler, but it specializes more into smart positioning and disarming opponents with weapons than straight hand-to-hand -hand fist fighting. His Slugger style has him using a baseball bat, and I'm gonna tell you right now, the screen pause when you do the light, light, heavy combo string is satisfying, especially when you can deck multiple people in one swing. <laughs> and then there's the breakdancing style. Like I said, one of the best parts of Yakuza is the way it's able to introduce humor into its setting while playing the major plot events extremely straight-faced, and that's an example. There are also a bunch of unlockable moves you can grab in each style that add a certain flair to the way you play. This means the way you use each style will change as the game goes on. Not significantly, but at least enough to notice. And don't tell me you've never heard of the heat mechanic. The Yakuza games are almost literally synonymous with this heat system. As you attack enemies, you build up the resource called Heat. As you build it, your attacks get faster and you get access to different abilities. But its main draw is that you can use a bunch of Heat at one time to execute these powerful finishing attacks. It's great to pull these off in combat. They're so well animated, each hit feels heavy and impactful, and they do hella damage, so you know, they're useful in addition to being stylish. Now the thing is, there are a lot of Heat actions in Yakuza 0. Like, a lot. Like, a, a lot a lot. How many? I'm not sure exactly. Anecdotally, I've heard there are over 100, and I've got no problem believing that. Someone in the Ryuga Gotoku Studio office probably has a folder with every single heat action animation in it, but unless that gets leaked, there are just too many to count. You've got different actions depending on the environment you're in, different actions depending on what you're holding. Picked up a portable stove? You bet that's got a unique heat action associated with it. I mean, even the salt shaker has its own unique heat action. There is no bigger dopamine hit than realizing the thing you're holding is gonna lead to you getting to see a rare heat action. Makes you wanna point at the screen and go wild. 
The game also encourages you to mix up your heat actions. If you use the same one over and over, it'll start to decrease in damage. Kinda like how moves go stale in Smash Ultimate or something. This is especially apparent in longer fights, like the boss encounters. Sure, using the ground kick heat action guarantees some easy damage, but you've got about three uses tops before it starts being a waste of your precious resource. And while you have a bunch of different combat options at your disposal, the important part is that the game encourages you to explore these options by rewarding you. During combat, you'll be awarded with these bonuses that'll give you an extra money boost. Money in Yakuza 0 is your experience, by the way. Aside from using it to pay for stuff, you also spend it on upgrades to power up Kiryu and Majima's fighting styles. When a battle ends, you can press a button to check which bonuses you got, as well as a list of other potential bonuses you could have earned. The cash difference isn't massive, you usually don't get too much from random battles anyways, but it's a decent nudge to encourage you not to just spam the optimal strategy to speedrun every encounter. Speaking of money, there's also a ton of stuff to do that isn't straight up fighting. I mentioned it a bit before, but there's a lot of alternate ways you can earn cash in Yakuza 0. You can gamble, bet in the, uh, the, the, the catfight club, and both Kiryu and Majima have a story-based minigame questline that'll rack in a bunch of cash as well. Kiryu gets to run a real estate empire where you go out and buy property to improve and turn your investment into those sweet, sweet Noguchis. Majima gets to run a cabaret club, which were starting to become popular around this era. You'll have to build an elite team of hostesses, and then manage them in what is essentially an alcohol-based RTS. Kiryu's minigame feels like an idle game where you just check in on it every now and again, but Majima's Cabaret Club questline is genuinely really fun. It's the kind of thing where you get access to it, sit through a long tutorial, and go, I do not care, I wish to return to the regular gameplay, please. But then after, you decide to head back and try it just once or twice, and then your Steam Count playtime suddenly looks like it's about to overtake the hundreds of hours you put into Team Fortress 2 in 2010. And all of these systems and minigames reward you with money, which makes sense in real life logic and game logic. And since you use money to level up, it all ties back into your character progression. You're picking up what I'm putting down, yeah? Everything you do ties back into character progression, so you're not wasting time by engaging with these minigames. You're earning meaningful rewards that you use to power up your main character, just like you would if you engage with the core gameplay, the fighting. You can absolutely break the economy and become Tokyo's first trillionaire if you fully max out these minigames, permanently eclipsing any money you could dream about earning from fighting, but let's not worry about that too much. But you might be wondering something. Why is Yakuza 0 so obsessed with money? It seems like every single thing is based around money. You can throw money into the streets to avoid random battles, you punch a guy and money just flies out of him. At the end of every chapter, you get a little bonus bit of flavor text saying what the equivalent of the amount of money you earned is. It's a bit jarring at first. None of the other games are like this. Why is Yakuza 0 suddenly the money game? I mean, it's kinda on brand for a game that's set in an underworld where cash is king and everything can be bought for the right price, but there's something else. I'll talk about it briefly, but disclaimer, you might have noticed, but I am not an economist. I know next to nothing about economics. I mostly know about this from a historical perspective, so if I get any details about how money works wrong, I mean, roast me for it in the comments, but uh, be gentle, you know? Yakuza 0 takes place in the year 1988, which lines up with what was known in Japan as the bubble economy. I'm not too big on the nitty gritty of how this stuff happens, but basically, asset, land, and stock value in Japan started to go way up. People were buying more, selling more, trading more stock, the financial market was more deregulated. Suddenly, everyone was getting real rich real fast, and it had a knock-on effect for the entire economy. The country was importing more, producing more, and everyone was getting in on their slice of the pie. It's a stretch to say everyone was rich, but take a look at this graph of the stock index. You'll see that especially in the 1980s, things were booming. I think a lot of people in Japan age 50 plus have a bit of nostalgia for this era. Toshihiro Nagoshi, the director, was born in 1965, which would make him 24 in 1989, basically the prime time to enjoy it. That's hearsay, by the way. I didn't actually ask him if he had a good time while the economy was booming, I'm just assuming. It makes sense that Yakuza 0 portrays a little bit exaggerated take on this slice of modern Japanese history. I'm sure to a lot of the staff making this game, the time period it's set in is almost inseparable from their memories of the bubble era. 
Now this was a short-term boom, I mean bubbles gotta burst. It would only last until the early 90s, eventually fizzling out and turning into what's known as the Lost Decade, a period of 10 years starting in 1991 where the Japanese economy would basically stagnate. But Lost Decade? Maybe we should change the name to Lost Forever, because it's 2023 and it's showing no signs of ending. Haha. <laughs> wow. Great. Epic. Nice. Uh, I don't know, man. Let's talk about something other than the general global trend of the average person being priced out of the ability to exist. Side quests? Yeah, side quests. One thing most people who have even a passing knowledge of the Yakuza series are familiar with, and where most of the wowie woohoo wacky game stuff comes from, is the sub-stories, which are basically this game's version of side quests. They're all isolated short stories that really let the game spread its wings and try out some new stuff. Both humorous, and, at times, kinda dramatic. But you know what you're here for. The sheer variety of different stories being told is intense. I mean, there's a hundred sub-stories in total, there's something of everything in here. Stuff like Kiryu teaching a bunch of wannabe Yankees how to be hood. Or how about that one where Majima fights a bunch of dudes, then accidentally helps invent consumption tax. The point of the side quest is basically the frog in the boiling water. Raise the temperature, i.e. tax, slowly, and eventually no one's gonna notice when it keeps getting higher and higher. What's funny is, when Majima's asked what the theoretical maximum should be, he says 8%, the number the Japanese sales tax was when the game was out. Yeah, uh, now it's 10% with another hike expected soon, so uh, so much for that. There's also the one where Majima enters a secret cult to save a woman's daughter, practices Munancho, then throws wrists at the leader. There's even non-combat ones, like when Majima has to pretend to be this girl's boyfriend to get her dad to stop trying to set her up. Like I said, there's a lot of variety. A lot of these sub-stories do just boil down to pick the correct answer out of three options to get the big reward, and some aren't exactly what I'd call winners, but you can tell the writers were really let loose with these. And I did mention how many references are stuffed inside this game, didn't I? Well, the side stories kick it up to like, 1000. Like, how about this side quest where you protect, and I'm not joking, Michael Jackson from Zombies, referencing not only Thriller, but Yakuza Dead Souls at the same time. Or how about this side quest where you meet a bunch of people lining up to buy Dragon Quest 3? I mean, legally distinct Dragon Quest 3. It even references the real-life urban legend that says that Square Enix was barred from ever releasing a Dragon Quest game on a weekday to avoid a massive loss of productivity. Actually, now that I'm researching it, it turns out it's kind of half true? The productivity thing is the reason Dragon Quest games only come out on Saturdays, but there wasn't any actual government interventions or laws passed. One source says police complained and asked them to make it Saturday, but it's only one source, so grain of salt. Anyways, I could hold us both here hostage while I read out the synopsis of my favorite sub-stories for a few solid days, but the takeaway is this. Don't skip them. Don't feel like you have to do all of them, cause uh, I mean, good luck and there are some duds in there, but give a few a chance, and you'll find a few favorites of your own. Graphics-wise, Yakuza 0 looks really good. Like, the character models in the cutscenes are really well detailed. Considering the length of some of them, you can really just kick back and feel like you're watching a crime drama at some points. Oh, hey, what's that? An asterisk? Wonder what that's about. That's a lot of asterisks. Yeah, so if you're putting two and two together with what I said about the Japanese release date, you've probably already figured it out. Yakuza 0 is technically a PS3 game. It might not have ever released on PS3 in English, but it sure as hell did in Japanese. Some stuff in the game looks, uh, kinda rough. Like NPC phases in the streets. My man here didn't get much time and attention, I'll tell you that for free. Face pancake to save render allowance on Sony's aging 2006 hardware. But in the same vein, isn't it kinda crazy that this was a PS3 game? Like, sure, NPCs look like their textures were made in Microsoft Paints, but you could never tell by looking at the cutscenes featuring the main characters. It makes it seem like, basically, magic. You get some serious subtle facial expressions in a lot of scenes. My Sakuga moment is this one where Nishiki's crying, the same scene I mentioned before, and I was just staring at the detail in his eyes. That's some big tier technology, that. I've already gone on enough about the environment and how great that looks, but there's some stuff that really benefits from the simple resolution bump. The Yakuza series would use a new engine starting with 6 that gave the visuals a pretty big boost, but for a late PS3 Yakuza game, Zero looks pretty good. One thing that is kinda weird though, is that this game is like, six different styles of cutscenes. Okay, that's kind of an exaggeration. I counted, and by that I don't mean I counted, I mean I'm looking at a wall right now trying to remember all of them, and there's five different styles, I think. 
There's the movie style cutscenes. They look great, love them, cheer for joy every time they're on the screen, etc. There's the text box cutscenes that are more static and use a lot of canned animations. I think the only downside to these is it involves a lot of the characters awkwardly bobbing their head while they say their lines like a late 2000s machinima. The dialogue will show up at the bottom of the screen, but the scenes will play out automatically like cutscenes. There's dialogue box scenes where text will show up on voice and you read through it, and there's phone cutscenes where you get these little picture-in-picture -picture boxes of the characters' faces as they talk on the phone. You might say those last three were kind of the same thing, and you might be right, there's room to argue there. But there ain't no room to argue with our final cutscene style. There are these weird static image cutscenes where the characters' faces will just, uh, twitch menacingly while their dialogue plays in the background. It reminds me a lot of some of those cutscenes from Bayonetta, you know the ones. It's kind of weird how they felt the need to invent a whole new cutscene style, like, there's no advantage to this over a movie scene or dialogue box scene. If you want it to look better, go for movie. If you want to save budget, go for dialogue box. But what's even weirder is that there's like, four, maybe, in the entire game? Like, one for every five hours? I don't know, someone's probably counted them. I often wonder what they were trying to do here. Was it a deliberate creative choice? Or time constraints? In the end, we'll never know. Now I talk about music a lot in my videos, but I don't really talk too much about sound design. That is, unless I have something to say. See, Tokyo and Osaka don't just look like their real-life counterparts, they sound like it as well. Yeah, sure, the audio quality of the ambient crowd noise could have been done a bit better, but you can really close your eyes and sink into the hustle and bustle of downtown Shinjuku. Actually, keep them open, we need the visual. Like, you're walking around and getting petitioned to go into an izakaya or a girls bar by some dude standing on the street. That's just real life, man. Also, there are these signs everywhere that say, uh, Kyakuhi wa jorei han desu. Which means, like, no touting, no barkering. But, uh, if you were to do, like, an any percent speed run of how fast you get petitioned to go to a shady place in Kabukicho, you know, you'd be setting world, world records just by walking down the street. Also, um, I don't know if I have to be, the, like, I hope I don't have to be the one to tell you this, but if someone petitions you to go to, <laughs> to, go to their shady soap land, don't go. Like, there's no gold at the end of that rainbow. I'm particularly fond of the ne ne soko no kimi coming out of the one store you hear every time you pass by Kiryu's real estate office. Also, as far as voice acting goes, the performances of the main characters are done really well. The story really comes alive through their voice acting. The three Dojima lieutenants are played by three real-life Japanese actors. Like, Awano is Riki Takeuchi, who starred in Tokyo Tribe, and was also, um, Immortan Joe from the Japanese dub of Mad Max. You know, I just gotta say, I love when I'm researching for these videos and come across this legit rare lore. Like, how else would I have found something like that out? In fact, most characters in the Yakuza slash Judgment series are based off the people who play them nowadays, with the exception of Kiryu and Majima, who have been there since the beginning. That isn't an issue though. Takaya Kuroda and Hidenari Ugaki both put in great work, especially Ugaki, flipping between Calm and Mad Dog Majima. There's no downside to having these actors voice characters, especially when they can also voice act. No, I lied. There is a downside if you count stuff like the time the Judgment main character's voice actor got Thanos snapped from magazine covers because his agency didn't feel like lending out his license anymore. Also, I just wanted to mention real quick before I forget, I really like the way this game handles accents. There's a bunch of write-ups on how the Yakuza localizers handle accents. Like, with Majima, he speaks in a heavy Kansai accent. The cheap and easy way a lot of companies use to localize this kind of thing is to do Kansai accent equals American South accent, or something like that. But Japanese accents don't really work like English ones do, so I really appreciate the team on the Yakuza series for going the extra mile. You can tell through the subtitles that Majima speaks appreciably different from, say, Kiryu, and it's not just basic stuff like making him say y'all or something. As I'm typing this, I found a great snippet from a PC Gamer article by Yakuza localization producer Scott Strichert. Strichartz? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, if you're watching, I mean, Mr. Scott. Pause the video and give it a read if you're into this kind of thing. When a localization is done really well, it just blends in. Your brain is like, yeah, this is all normal. And that's the feeling I get when playing Yakuza 0. Nothing feels awkward or out of place, especially considering how, like, 1000% Japanese this game is. You might not expect a game like Yakuza to have banging music. 
You also might not expect one of its songs where Kiryu sings about drowning life sorrows in whiskey to become known in the mainstream as a meme, but, you know, we do be living in current year. While I'm not just talking about the karaoke here, I do like the karaoke a lot. I mean, obviously. I have this running joke where I say if my video gets an unreasonable amount of likes, I'll do a karaoke cover of X song from the game. I honestly just came up with it on a whim, like, two years ago. I never intend to make any of those, it's just a throwaway gag. I do get a lot of people in the comments asking me to make it a more reasonable goal and to actually make one, but that's not how the joke works. I mean, trust me, I'm protecting you here, you do not want to hear my singing. But okay, how about this? 10 mil likes, and I'll do a Bakamitai karaoke cover. And as a show of good faith, I'll stick a little present to the end of this video, assuming it doesn't get me demonetized, in which case I'll have edited this part out anyways. Maybe. If I remember. But let's forget about karaoke for a sec. Yakuza Zero's action is punctuated by some really hype music. I mean, when you look at the composer and see he's got stuff like F-Zero GX on his resume, say no more. There's a lot of tracks I like, but I'll just say this. Pledge of Demon is the hottest track. Don't at me saying otherwise, I will not reply. The Kuze pop-off, the one in the sewer, you know the one. If that doesn't get you pumped up to absolutely go full live leak on this greasy gangster, I'm not exactly sure what will. Speaking of music that gets you pumped up to fight, the music dynamically changes depending on which battle style you're using in combat. Like for example, Kiryu's brawler combat music sounds different from his rush one. I, uh, I can't believe I never noticed that in my first playthrough back in 2017. Either that or I forgot it, but that doesn't sound like something I would do. But enough about the music, I've mentioned one thing about the Yakuza series a few times that may have you raising a few eyebrows. How can a game where one of the protagonists hits up the disco and races minicars while the other sings karaoke with one of his staff completely switch gears and hit you with a dramatic moment that'll make you feel like there's a rock in your stomach? And more importantly, how does that even work? Tonal whiplash is a big buzzword that floats around media, both now and back in the day. How can Uncharted Man take out half the population of South America and still be cracking Marvel movie quips every 10 seconds, etc.? I think, first of all, the Yakuza series characterizes Kiryu and Majima through the gameplay pretty well. While the series may feel like it gives you less freedom than other open-world games, it's very careful to only allow you to do things that Kiryu and Majima would actually do. You can't just brawl random civilians, you fight people who instigate. I mean, there's a ton of plot points about how doing things like that would draw unnecessary attention to the clan. There's always a sense that the actions you can take as these characters are consistent with their writing. But the more important point is, how are you meant to know what these characters would do? How are you supposed to know exactly who these characters are? Yakuza 0 was likely a big point of reflection for the RGG studio. It was around the 10-year anniversary of the series that this game came out. It was a chance to see how far this series had come, and with a setting that's 20 years removed from the rest of the games, a chance to do a little reinventing. A lot of series suffer from what I'm gonna call the bigger better mentality. Where this desire to make every sequel bigger and more bombastic than the last ends up bloating the core experience. You can probably think up a few examples of this. Hell, even Yakuza was a victim of this. I cracked a joke earlier about it, but Yakuza 5 having 5 playable characters in 5 different cities led to a lot of the great bits of that game getting buried under the weight. Compare that to Zero's 2 characters in 2 cities. I mean, the Haruka sections in Yakuza 5 are basically the equivalent to getting clotheslined in terms of pacing. Yakuza 0 was a chance to reel the series back in a bit, to refocus the narrative on a few core main characters. I've already told you that the Kiryu and Majima in this game are a bit different from their later versions in the series, and Yakuza 0 is a journey to see how they become those people. Yakuza 0 is a chance to see what events shaped them into the people we would spend time with in Yakuza 1, 2, 3, etc. While this next point is true for every Yakuza game, in Yakuza 0 you get to spend a lot of time just existing as these characters outside of the main plot. 
In most games, you don't really need to know mundane stuff about your character, like their favorite food or what they think about certain things, but in Yakuza, you sure do get to know it. You develop an intimate knowledge of these characters, but more importantly, you get insight into what drives them, what their moral compass is. When awful things happen to them, it hits all the harder because you were just doing some goofy side story where you learn the key to brawling from a mysterious Caucasian or something. And more, more importantly, you learn how these characters' personal morals clash with Yakuza Zero's villains. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that morals and organized crime aren't usually two words you'll find in the same sentence. I mean, why do you think pretty much every Yakuza game speedruns finding an excuse for Kiryu to get kicked out of the Yakuza in some way, shape, or form? Everything Majima and Kiryu knew, all the rules they believed in, are suddenly ripped out right in front of them, and this game being the beginning of their stories, we get to see how they would form their own rules, their own morals, their own sense of justice. You don't just want to square up with Owano because he's your nemesis, you want to because his morals and ideals are at fundamental opposition with yours. You don't just want to hammer fist Kuze over the dome because he's a slimy dirtbag in this game's version of the Pursuer from Dark Souls 2, it's because he's a slimy dirtbag who will do anything necessary to get what he wants, and you ain't about to agree with that. The antagonists in this game are playing by their own rules, operating on their own compass. Which means, fights in the Yakuza series are less about two burly shirtless men throwing wrists at each other, and more like two ideals punching each other in the face until only one is left standing. I mean, that's the best reason I can come up with as to why when you beat one of these dudes with zero morals up, they don't just whip out a gun and be like, lol, you didn't win though. So, I guess with all that out of the way, it's time to talk about the final plot events, do a bit more character analysis, and discuss how the game sticks its landing. Spoilers are gonna flow like water from here, so if you're planning to play the game for yourself, which you definitely should if you haven't by the way, skip to this timestamp to avoid them. Okay, that's long enough. So, it's no secret that this game is an absolutely intricate web of alliances, betrayals, and plot twists. There's so much here, it's gonna be hard to concisely summarize it in a way that won't just be going, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, but I'll try my best. So, Majimo was protecting Makoto with Lee, the massive man from her office, but she was captured by Seda, the leader of the enigmatic Nikyo Consortium, a sort of black ops faction in the Tojo clan. Sagawa forces Majima to come with him to get her back, and when Seda confronts Majima, he reveals, surprise, he's an ally, and he's been working with Tachibana to get Makoto to Tokyo. But then, out of nowhere, Sagawa shows up and pops Seda in the chest, and they both pick up the business card of Seda's contact, Kazuma Kiryu. Sagawa forces Majima at gunpoint to go to Tokyo with him, and we can see how much Majima's proverbial chains are starting to wear on him. The Sagawa-Majima interaction is some of the best stuff in the game. There's a few scenes where Majima has to lie to him, and the tension during them is absolutely palpable. So by this point, you might be wondering, what is with everyone's obsession over Makoto Makimura? It turns out, that empty lot that everyone's gunning for, that 10 meter square patch of dirt everyone's killing each other over, she's the owner, and she doesn't know it. It was her grandfather's, and when he died, it passed on to her. So now, everyone's gunning for her to get their hands on it. We see a few hours earlier, Oda, Tachibana's right-hand man, came with Kiryu to Osaka to find Makoto. They pick her up and are driving home when Shibusawa rolls up an entire hit squad army on them. And Kiryu fights them all off. With a pistol. One pistol. Again, I'd like to remind you that Kazuma H. Kiryu has never canonically killed a man. I'm just gonna pretend this whole car chase scene happens in the cutscene dimension. The three stop at a construction site when Oda plays his hand. He knows who Makoto is, and he knows if Tachibana finds out, he'll never forgive him. Two years ago, Oda was the man with the bat tattoo that kidnapped Makoto and made her go blind. You see, Makoto and Tachibana were actually born in China to a Japanese mother, and the big twist is, is that they're brother and sister. Tachibana was a rough youth who came to Japan to escape discrimination. Apparently, he was so godlike at fighting, Oda vowed a lifelong oath to him and they formed a gang. Look, this is just how it works in the Yakuza-verse, don't question it. Makoto came a few years later as a child of a war orphan and moved in with her Japanese grandfather. She moved to Osaka in search of Tachibana, and that's where Oda captured her, but at the time, he didn't know she was Tachibana's sister. That is, until Tachibana and Oda were watching TV and Tachibana recognized her. 
Putting two and two together, Oda realized Tachibana would never forgive him for what he'd done if Makoto told him, so he tried to kill Kiryu and Makoto on the spot, before Makoto stabs him and he's overpowered by Kiryu. With Shibusawa's crew closing in on them, Oda knows he won't be able to escape, so he uses his gun to buy them time. Yeah, nice try Yakuza Zero, but you ain't exactly redeeming a human trafficker that easy. Oda's confronted by Shibusawa himself, who reveals that Oda had been on his payroll the whole time. That's how the Dojima family knew every step Tachibana was gonna take, Oda was filling them in on it. Back in Tokyo, Kiryu takes Makoto to a safe place. The, uh, park full of homeless people, of course, and then has a rendezvous with Tachibana. There's a really emotional moment where Tachibana is unsure if he should even meet his sister. How, by abandoning her in China, he knows he basically ruined her life, and he's done a lot of things he's not proud of since then. But at the same time, that's what all of this has been for, to meet his sister again. And there's, you know, the whole lot that's worth a bajillion dollars thing, but also to meet his sister. But before he can meet her, Kiryu gets shot and Tachibana is captured by the Dojima family, who are trying to interrogate him to find Makoto's location. You can feel how close these two are getting at this point. They're in the same city, just a short walk from each other. You feel the tension, how they're so close, yet so far. The tension builds when Kiryu runs into Nishiki for the first time since the standoff in the woods, and Nishiki, being Nishiki, the man who would do anything to reach the top, throws everything away to back up his bro. This is why I love Yakuza Zero. We know who Nishiki is, what he becomes. I mean, sorry to spoil like the first 30 minutes of Yakuza 1, a 20 year old game, but Nishiki is the main antagonist. Before Yakuza 0, we only knew one side of Nishiki, a man we were told was once Kiryu's best friend, but we only got to see as a power-hungry villain. Well, right here, right now, the game is showing us the relationship these two had. Sure, there are things like Kiryu telling him to do whatever it takes to reach the top where you can see the beginnings of his mentality start to form, but we get to see the genuine friendship these two shared. We're given so much more context, it basically adds another dimension to Yakuza 1 if you were to go play it after Zero. This is what I mean when I say Yakuza 0 is like the platonic ideal of what a prequel should be. Back to the game, everything comes to a head when Kiryu finds out where the Dojima family has been keeping Tachibana, and he's pretty much dead. Kiryu knocks out everyone in the room before swearing revenge on the entire Tojo clan and bringing Tachibana out. Makoto finally gets to meet her brother, the event the entire story has been building up to, but he's already gone, and she runs away. Meanwhile, Majima and Sagawa meet with Shimano, who reveals he's 4D chess to the whole situation from the beginning. He ordered Majima to kill Makoto because he knew he couldn't do it. He knew he'd try to help her and gain her trust. That's when Majima would deliver her to Shimano, and he'd use the power and influence to betray the Tojo clan and get crowned king by the Omi Alliance dudes he's making shady deals with or something. Also, I love how they characterize Shimano's character so quickly in this single 10 second scene. It perfectly encompasses the kind of person he is. Yakuza Zero is great at this. The way he eats this fugu sashimi, you know, puffer fish, like from that one episode of The Simpsons. The stuff that poisons you if it's not prepared correctly so it has to be painstakingly cut piece by piece, leading to its high price. Wait. Mr. Simpson, son, I shall be burnt. We have reason to believe you have eaten poison. Poison? <laughs> What should I do? What should I do? Tell me quick! The stuff you're supposed to delicately enjoy one piece at a time. You know, like the luxury food item it is. He just shovels ten pieces in at once. He's a glutton. He gets what he wants. Expensive food? Who gives a shit? He'll eat it like McDonald's fries. Mmm, the visual storytelling is so good in this game. Majima, getting more and more frustrated with the situation, finds Makoto, and she's starting to regain her sight, but she can still only see silhouettes. She's reasonably pretty messed up after that stuff with her brother, and wants revenge on the Dojima family. The Majima-Makoto relationship is a complex one. You might not see it at first, but these two have basically been through the same events. Captured, tortured, used, and thrown out. Held on a leash so other people can extract what they want out of them. Their bond changes from hitman and target to allies. Majima tries to convince her that revenge isn't what Tachibana would have wanted her to do, but she goes through with it, which leads her to getting captured. To which, Dojima reveals this cool legal loophole, where, turns out, if you kill the person who owns a piece of land, you can just own it, no problem. Because, I mean, the owner isn't gonna come looking for it, right? Uh, apparently? Uh, I, I barely know economics, can someone tell me if that's how legal works? 
As a side note, while Makoto and Majima's relationship is a strong part of the narrative, I wish the game treated her character a bit less like an objective in a 4v4 capture the flag on Blood Gulch. The one time the game does allow its lead female character to have any agency at all, it just rubs her nose in it by virtue of how bad of an idea it was. Anyways, basically everyone is after Dojima at this point, since the influence and power he would gain if he secured the empty lot would pretty much upend the entire Tojo clan. Kazama, foreseeing this, laid all the pieces in place, Tachibana, the Nikyo Consortium, all to keep the empty lot out of Dojima's hands. It's kind of weird how this game portrays Kazama like a savant tactician god who orchestrated all this from behind bars, but he hasn't been in the main series for a while, so I get they wanted to give him a big role. Makoto survives Dojima's assassination attempt, and she's taken to a boat owned by Sera, who's alive by the way, to recover, which unfortunately, Shibusawa is well aware of. Shibusawa seemed like the most reasonable of Dojima's three lieutenants. He was calm, collected, he was the only one willing to hear Kiryu out in the beginning when he said he didn't commit the murder. But it turns out, he's the most ruthless of the three. He's cruel and power hungry. It's an all-out war between the Nikyo Consortium and the Dojima family at this point, and Kiryu is caught in the middle as he tries to protect Makoto. On the other side, Majima heads into the Dojima office. He wants to take Dojima out to ensure no one ever goes after Makoto again. This dungeon is cool because it's the exact same one Kiryu went through in the beginning of the game, Majima's retracing his steps. You get to where Kiryu fought Kuze in Chapter 2 and the dungeon ended, but then you keep going. You're going past where you could before. It's a good way of making you reflect on everything you've done so far, making you think about how far you've come. Majima takes everyone out when Seta shows up, and says with everything they got on Dojima, they can prevent him from ever getting a sniff of power again. Back on the boat, Kiryu finds Makoto, but she's being held by Shibusawa. This is it, the final encounter, and believe you me, there was no bigger pop-off than when Shibusawa rips off his coat and reveals that he also has a dragon tattoo. A major theme in the Yakuza series has been the duel of the dragons, for example, Yakuza 2. I mean, Kiryu is the legendary dragon of Dojima in the later games, after all. This scene is basically saying, if Kiryu wants his title, he's gonna have to take it. Unfortunately, Shibusawa is no match for Kiryu in his 10 liter sippy cup of 1980s Japanese Red Bull, so he squashes his ambitions right then and there. So, everything seems to have gone well. After the dust settles, Kiryu decides to go back to the Yakuza and starts wearing his iconic white suit and red shirt. Majima tells Shimano that he won't be delivering Makoto to him. To which, Shimano goes, well, that sucks, and pops his Omi Alliance contact in the head to bury his involvement. Majima, having been manipulated for basically the past 30 hours and being told it's because honest guys like him are easy to manipulate, adopts the Mad Dog personality. But Majima's ending is a really melancholic one, and it's not an exaggeration to say that his character, in its 10 years of existence prior to this, had never been in a situation as emotionally challenging as this one. He meets Makoto again when she's being harassed by two Yakuza. He one-shots them into the dirt, but he realizes he can't speak to her. She's never seen what he looks like, but she knows his voice, and he knows he can't let her see who he really is. They live in two different worlds. The most he can do is tell someone else who genuinely cares about her to treat her as best they can, and then he walks off. This scene is powerful, and it's extremely sad. This is a part of Majima that he had to throw away. If you had said before Yakuza 0 that Goro Majima was a man you could tell a romance story about and it'd not only be believable, but also hard-hitting, I don't know who would have believed you. I don't think I would have believed you. And as Majima disappears into the crowd, blending in with the other faces, we know that these two will never see each other again. Sort of. Yakuza Kiwami 2 has an extra side story about it. But there is one person Majima is going to meet. Throughout Yakuza 0, Kiryu and Majima's storylines intertwined, but they never directly intersected. That is, until the credits finish rolling, when the pair finally come face to face for the first time, and Majima belts out his iconic... But Marge, that little guy hasn't done anything yet. He's gonna do something, and you know it's gonna be good. Alright, let's wrap this up. Should you play Yakuza 0? Yes. There is literally no reason not to. It's available on PC for practically free during a sale, and it's the perfect jumping in point for anyone who wants to start playing this series. It really is just that simple. 
Sorry for the shorter than usual outro, but I'm trying to have this last a particular amount of time here, you'll see. Hope you tune in for my next video. I haven't decided what it'll be on yet, but I have a few options. I've pretty much got my full year of videos planned out, and I'm pretty excited for it. Maybe you will be too. Anyways, till next time. Oh,